So uh, let's move on to the next section of the, the Farm Bill that we're going to cover, and that's the conservation title. Um, and we're lucky to have Eric Lichtenberg uh, to help with that. I, I don't know how many of you were here on Monday when the, we had uh, Director General Playwa from the EU and, and uh, Bill Northey, who's the Undersecretary at USDA, but both were sort of touting in, uh, conservation programs. Um, and certainly one looks at ecosystem services and things like that. They like to point to things, well, at least we're getting something for our dollar. Um, but I think Eric will talk a little about that. and, and um, uh, Eric, of course, is a professor of agriculture and natural resource economics at the University of Maryland. Um, his research covers a, a number of topics. I know he, I've seen a lot of work on food safety, um, invasive spe uh, pests, um, and targeting of environmental ben benefits. Uh, his early work on econometrics of damage control with, with David Silverman, um, very uh, heavily quoted, um, uh, received an award for enduring quality w from the AEA, um, and uh, very, very pleased to have Eric one contribute to the book. Uh, his chapter is, uh, really stands out and um, be able to join us today. So Eric, if you would. Right, well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today, and um, I guess I get to talk about the one part of the Farm Bill that seems to, people seem to like, you know. I mean, we can, we can brag on crop insurance, which is an obvious waste of money, and we can, we can ask questions about the commodity programs and why we're giving lots of money to relatively wealthy people. But conservation programs are doing something for the environment, uh, and they're stepping into a vacuum. Right? Because if you think about it, most of the environmental problems we have that emanate from agriculture are non-point source pollution type problems. And EPA really hasn't had the wherewithal to deal with them over time. They're just beginning to try to tackle those. Right? And I think the conservation programs have stepped into the breach uh, and they perform a very important function that way. So. It's kind of nice I don't have to get up here and brag about how bad they are and about uh, what a waste of money they are, although they do waste money. Uh, and let's see here. Oh, yeah. Okay, so one, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that conservation programs have always sort of served two masters, right? On the one hand, they're there to provide environmental protection. On the other hand, they're there to provide income support. And back in the days of the Great Depression, these two masters were largely the same. There's very close complementarity between them because the big deal was taking highly erodible land out of production, okay, which helped to support farm prices. And teaching farmers how to better protect their land from erosion. Okay, which protected their long-term productivity and long-term profitability. Uh, and that worked fine up until really the post-war period and really up until the 1960s with the intensification of agriculture, uh, the greater use of chemicals, uh, at which point water pollution for runoff of fertilizers and pesticides became the much more predominant problem and really soil erosion receded a lot. Uh, and so there's always a tension about how much of the money in conservation programs is really going to address environmental quality and how much is going to um, really be a way of channeling income support. And that's especially important now because uh, conservation payments are not subject to the same kind of limitations under WTO rules that commodity program supports are. Right? So they're green box. Everybody loves them. You don't have to ask so many embarrassing questions about them. Um, the question I want to ask is whether the current, the new Farm Bill does better in terms of environmental performance than the ones that have come before. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so there are two major types of programs. Uh, one of them basically focuses on taking land, taking active cropland out of production, 
putting it into conservation uses like grassland or trees or wetlands, things like this. Um, and that's CRP, let's see, oh yeah, CRP and ASAP. Uh, the other strand is <clears throat> providing subsidies for installing and or maintaining conservation practices on working farmland and equip and CSP are the exemplars of that approach. And then we have this regional conservation partnership program which uses both for watershed or regional scale projects uh, undertaken by government agencies. Um, okay, now like Barry I was scrambling to keep up with the text of the conference report and uh, ferreting out all of the uh, spending numbers was not something I was successful in doing. So these are numbers that are from the uh, CBO scores of the House and Senate bills. They're roughly on par with the numbers that Rob put up. But you see that the Farm Bill will spend about six billion a year on these programs. Okay, and conservation is now, if you think about uh, Conservation is going to account for about 30% of direct farm payments, okay, on a par with what it's been for, say, the last farm bill or so. Okay, so we have the big three programs here represented. Uh, unfortunately, conservation fell into third place behind commodity programs this time. I think we were in second place with the 2014 farm bill. Oh, well, you know, sometimes you just can't compete. Um, okay. Let me run through um, oh, actually, the other piece is that um, traditionally, well, 20 years ago, uh, land diversion, land retirement was by far the predominant kind of conservation program. The Conservation Reserve Program, I think, in 1991 was like 99 percent of all conservation spending. <laughs> Uh, beginning in 2002, Congress started ramping up payments for conservation on working farmland um, to the point where in 2018, uh, CRP was down to 40% of spending and EQIP and CSP together were about 55%. Okay, and the 2018 Farm Bill will retain that kind of split. There will be more spending on, on working farmland conservation than on a land retirement. Um, okay, this is complicated. I have five different major programs to talk about. Um, for the Conservation Reserve Program, this is a program where the government pays farmers to put highly erodible cropland into conservation uses, uh, keep it there. These are five to 10 year contracts. There is an annual competitive reverse auction process in which farmers put in a bid. They offer a parcel of land. They ask for a rental rate for that land. Uh, NRCS technicians come out and look at the parcel. They construct an environmental benefits index. And then um, that environmental benefits index is used to rank all the parcels. Okay, the ones with the highest benefits index are the ones that get accepted ones that are below a cutoff are not accepted. A um, couple things that the conference committee report does, the size of the conservation, the cap on conservation reserve acreage got cut from 30 some million acres down to 24 million. It's going to get raised gradually uh, back up to 27 million by 2023. To control costs, uh, rental rates are going to be capped at 80 percent of the county average. Uh, now this in itself is really not as sensible an idea as you might think, right? Why? Because what we care about paying for is environmental benefits and not land. We want to pay for performance and not for effort. Uh, and this cap is basically restricting payment for effort and not taking performance into account, right? It's like if you could buy 10 of something for $10 and 20 for $15, right? But a cap on spending meant you couldn't buy the uh, 15, you couldn't spend $15 for it, even though the cost per item was cheaper. Okay, and so there may, and well, there may well be parcels of land that have very, very high environmental benefits for diversion, 
but which are also expensive because they're very productive. And this cap will not allow those to be put into the CRP. Uh, the other problem with CRP historically is that uh, the acreage is just, the geographic distribution of acreage is highly skewed. There's lots and lots of it here in the plains areas and not a lot in places where water pollution is a big problem or where diversion of land could do something for water pollution. Um, that turns out to be an artifact of the way that the Environmental Benefits Index is constructed. It overweights things like wildlife habitat and wind erosion, and it doesn't take into account how many people are affected. Right? So it basically puts all this land in the middle of the country, in the middle of nowhere, where there may be environmental benefits, but nobody cares. Uh, well, not many people care. And wildlife habitat turns out to be land uh, for pheasants and, and waterfowl. I've seen pictures of you know, people hunting on CRP land as a, an advertisement for CRP. Um, now, the, um, uh, the new farm bill basically partially freezes that geographic distribution of acreage by requiring that 60 percent of the acreage in CRP stay where it was in uh, like 27, 2007 through 2016. So it's going to limit the ability of, of USDA to shift CRP land to more productive places. Um, okay, EQUIP is basically a program that subsidizes up to 75 percent of the cost of installing conservation structures or purchasing specialized equipment you need for conservation. Um, the big problem with EQUIP as well is that the funds are distributed on a formula basis and they're distributed on the basis of how much farming do you have, not on the basis of where could we do the most good for the environment. Okay. Um, and there's also a, a restriction that 60% that of the spending has to be devoted to livestock, 5% for wildlife habitat. Um, The, uh, the current farm, the new farm bill basically keeps that structure in place. The structure, by the way, is inherited from the, from the Depression, from the New Deal era. It's carried through all the way to present. Uh, um, the livestock set aside is lower. Wildlife habitat set aside is higher. Um, there's an increase in the maximum cost share rate for projects that deal with water quality. That's a good thing. Um, there's higher payment limitations for organic production. Um, and there's also a conservation incentive payment program uh, that's targeted towards watersheds with, with identified priority resource concerns, uh, which could be a positive thing. It's more of a pilot than anything else, I think. Um, the conservation stewardship program uh, was actually on the chopping block this year. Uh, the House Republicans wanted to get rid of it. Uh, they were not successful, just as they were unsuccessful with SNAP. Um, and in fact, um, in fact, I think there are significant, if I read the law correctly, if I read the conference report correctly, I'm not a lawyer, um, there's a significant improvement here uh, because previously conservation stewardship funds were distributed on the basis of uh, each state's share of farmland. So formula funding, once again, now it appears that um, funds will be distributed on the, all the proposed projects will be evaluated on the basis of resource conservation and environmental benefits, and they will be evaluated nationally. Okay. Um, and there's also increases in subsidies for uh, cover crops and a number of other practices that certainly here in Maryland we, we like a lot as means of reducing nitrogen runoff. Okay, I'm going to skip the agricultural conservation easement program. This is Vince's favorite, so we can go back to him. But, but why the federal government has an easement program, farmland preservation program, remains a mystery. Um, regional conservation partnership program. This is basically for big regional projects. The Chesapeake Bay program is one of these. Um, good news here is that there's a big increase in funding uh, for these regional partnerships. They are 
uh, distributed, funds are distributed on the basis of sort of national competitive, there, more of them will be distributed on the basis of national competition and identified priorities. Um, and they are targeted towards water quality and water saving as well. So good thing in my opinion. So um, basically, I think if we think about uh, where, the, uh, where the 2018 bill goes in terms of whether it improves uh, conservation, environmental performance of, of conservation programs, whether it detracts from them, it's a mixed bag. On the whole, I think there are some, some important positive steps forward that at least give USDA the opportunity to better target the environmental problems we have from agriculture uh, than they could in the past. And so I think this is actually a very positive step forward uh, on the net. Thank you.